Hi folks, this is Redwood Nut coming to you with another Red Spit Time story. This one you might find kind of interesting. Uh, I lived at 4121 Richmond and uh, several of my businesses, most of the business I did was in the 18th district on uh, Wall Street, 1343, 1345, that area. At any rate, I was at my home on Richmond and I was having a poker game. And at that poker game, there were three attorneys and a judge and myself. And we were playing cards. And I needed more money. So I went down to the store. We took a break on the game. And I left the folks at my store, at my home. And I got in the car. And I brought Lenny with me and another man with me. And we went down to Wall Street, 1345 Wells. I had a pretty good relationship with just about everybody in the 18th district. Uh, district commander, just about everybody knew me. However, on this particular date, I went inside the store and took a bag full of money and uh, about $25,000 somewhere in that neighborhood, and uh, it was in a bank bag, uh, uh, a bag that was marked by the bank, and it was like a sack, you know, and so I threw it in the back seat, and I was driving, I pulled out of the driveway, and they were making repairs on Wall Street at that time, so almost right in front of my driveway, so when I pulled out, I had just bought this new Cadillac, and I pulled out, and I may have spun the tires a little bit because there was sand on the pavement. But at any rate, uh, I had a scanner in the car. I listened to it, and I said, hey, guys, we're going to pull a stop because there was a tactical unit right behind me. And so I was sitting at North Avenue. As I made a left-hand turn, he flashed his light on me. And I pulled over, and... I waited till Jerry Brennan and uh, Casper Johnson approached the vehicle. And Bill Murray, who was the sergeant at that time and leader of the TAC unit, um, I didn't know him at all. And so I went to Jerry Brennan, who I did know, and said, Jerry, there's a thousand dollars. Just kill this thing on the street. I don't want any problems. And he says, look, I can't do it. He said, I don't even know this guy. This first night we're working with the sergeant. He said, I don't, I don't want to play any games with him. I don't lose my job. And so I said, okay. I got out of the car, and the other two people were taken out of the car. They were asked to sit on the uh, curb on the side. And I walked towards uh, Sergeant Murray, Bill Murray. And as I walked towards him, um, I told him, I said, I'm armed. And he said, uh, okay. And I slid my jacket aside and I was carrying a Model 60, a Smith & Wesson Model 60. And uh, he asked me to take it out of the holster. I did. After I unloaded it, because he asked me to, then he took possession of it. Then the guys in the car were making kind of jokes and they were saying, oh look at all the money we found in the car and this and that and he didn't know what to do. He just didn't know what to do as a supervisor. So he called it in as a UUW, unlawful use of a weapon. And at that particular time, uh, I sat down in the back seat of the car. He didn't cuff me yet. And uh, my partner was on the side of the curb and he said, look, it's over a half hour. If you're gonna charge me, charge me. I didn't commit a crime. And so he said, oh, you wanna go to jail? Okay, you're charged. And so then they said uh, they were going to take the money. And uh, I told Casper and I told uh, uh, Jerry Brennan, I said, you're going to be totally, I laughed. I said, you're going to be totally responsible for everything that's in that bag because I have it counted. And so Murray didn't know what to do. And he said, uh, okay. He said, how about, they asked me where it came from. And I said, for my safe and my business. I have a business at 30, 1345 Wells. And so he asked me if I would uh, 
let uh, Lenny have the car with the money in it. And I said, no way. I said, you know, there's no way to protect it. And so we went through a bunch of scenarios on what to do. Finally, he let me drive my own car back to the store. And he said, do you want to leave the money in here? But he wanted to watch me go into my safe. And I said, no, I'm not going to. So eventually what happened was I went to 113 East Chicago Avenue, the Chicago Avenue Police Station, 18th District, and uh, I went inside. And so I was holding this bag of money. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, you can't have that in here. He said, give it to the desk sergeant. Well, the desk sergeant knew me. And he looked at me and he said, no, no, I don't want to be responsible for that. <laughs> he said, I'm not, I'm not touching Red's money. <laughs> he said, that's it. And so he said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, I don't know. It's here. Here, it's yours. And you're responsible for it. And so <laughs> uh, just about that time, uh, they took me up to the tack room upstairs. And uh, they started talking to me. And Jerry Brennan came to me. Or, excuse me, Bill Murray came to me. And he said... Uh, couple things, small talk. And he says, I bet you, you know, some, certain things. And so I said, I said, I said to him, I bet you know a lot of people that I know. Because he had mentioned that he was on task force. And he said, yeah, like who? And I said, oh, I don't know. I know a lot of guys that were on task force. And so he said, like who? And I said, how about Nicky Rosado? Yes, you know him? And he says, hell yeah, I know him. He said, how do you know him? Were you busted out in 8th, 8th District? And I said, no, Nicky's a good friend of mine. I've never been arrested before. And so <laughs> he said, well, if he's such a good friend of yours, where does he live? And I gave him his address because it was right off the top of my head. And it was about 1 o'clock in the morning by this time, maybe 1.30. And he said to me, uh, uh, what do you think he's going to say if you call him? And I said, he's not at home. And he said, oh, that's convenient. And I said, no, he's at a summer place in Michigan. He has a, a summer home in Michigan. And so he said, uh, and you don't have his number out there, do you? And I said, yes, I do. And so I had it memorized. I didn't have to look it up. And uh, I went to the phone, and I dialed him. And Nick answered the phone. And when he answered the phone, he said, only, Michigan was out one hour ahead, you know, of Chicago time-wise. And Nick said to me, only one dartboard could ever call me and wake me up at this time of night. He said, what do you want? And I said, I got a problem here. I said, there's a guy here, I've been arrested. And so he said, oh, he said, you know, he started talking to me and I couldn't hear him because Murray grabbed the phone out of my head hand and they walked he walked a little ways away from me he told me to go down to the end of the hall and he talked to Nick and later on I found out what Nick said to him but anyway when it came back he didn't want to be any part involved in this arrest so he had Casper Johnson go on the paperwork he actually signed the paperwork and said he made the arrest and he was real nice to me I go down to lockup and uh, downstairs, and as they put me in lockup, um, the field lieutenant was there. He said, hey, Red, what's going on? And I said, I'm being arrested. And he said, oh. And he said, who, what, what happened? And I said, talk to them guys, they, they did it. And Casper and, and uh, Jerry Brennan, they looked at me and they didn't want to be part of this thing. They really didn't, but they got jammed down their throat by Bill Murray. So Sergeant Murray decided that this was going to be it. So they put me inside lockup, and when I got in there, he said, don't go back by the trunk tank. He said, uh, just sit over here, and you can watch TV or do something. And then when it came up to have my fingerprints taken, he just slid them. He put ink on them but he slid them all the way across the cards. They weren't printable at all. 
And uh, when it came time for him, my photograph taken, he went zip and pulled the film out of the camera and he says, we're out of film for the night. And I, he said, just sit over there and wait for a while. And I did. Well, by that time, I had three screaming lawyers outside, because Lenny was not arrested, neither was the other guy that was with him. They were outside and they were saying they wanted to see me, that they were my attorney. All three of them said they were my attorney. And this kind of threw the district into an uproar. Anyway, long and short was the district commander came down and he told me, he said, if you have any parking tickets or anything like that, will you come back in because your prints had to come back? And I said, sure, no problem. And I went home. I get to court uh, a couple weeks later, something like that, and uh, it goes before gun court up on Love of the State. And I talked to the uh, uh, attorney that was with me, and he said, oh, he said, I know, that I, he said, I know the judge very well. And I said, uh, okay. And he said, don't worry about anything, it's going to be okay. And in the hallway at the courtroom, I saw Casper Johnson, and I felt bad. I felt bad for him. He approached me, and my lawyer says, "Don't talk to him." And I said, "Shut up." And I talked to Casper. He said, "Am I in a jam here? How bad am I going to get jammed up?" I said, "Don't worry about anything. Just tell the truth. Don't lie. Say everything just like it was." So we walked, we approached, came into the courtroom, and the judge immediately stopped the case that was going and waved at my attorney and says, how you doing? Haven't seen you in a long time. And he set that case aside. And he, last thing I heard was he said, you know, my client waives his right to be there. They're calling each other on a first name basis. And he said, my client waives his right to be here during the trial. And he said, granted. And so I left and I went home. And after I got home, uh, I just went about things normally. It didn't upset me at all. And uh, I get a phone call from my attorney. And he told me, he said, the case was thrown out of court. And Judge Trezeka, I believe was his name, he ordered that the weapon be returned to you by the officers that took it. And I said, OK. And he said, it's over at the 18th District now. And so I said, thank you, and hung up the phone called the 18th district and I got property department and uh, I talked to them and they said hey come on and pick it up and I said I don't want to go in and pick it up if I come in and pick it up I'm loving to get arrested for holding it again I'm not coming there's no way I'm just not coming and he said I don't care what you do he said it'll be destroyed in 30 days and I said okay thank you hung up called my attorney told him and he called the judge. He knew his home phone number. And the judge calls me and he asked me for a statement. And I told him, I told him what happened. And he said, okay. He said, uh, they'll have to appear before me in court in the morning for failure to uh, follow a court order because I court ordered that they return it to you. And he hung up the phone. It had to be somewhere around 10, 30, 11 o'clock that night that there was a knock on my door. And I had a door and a screen door. And I opened up the door and uh, it was Bill Murray. And he had a tape recorder in his hand. And there was another officer with him. They were driving a, a van, an undercover van. And he passed the, uh, the pistol to him. And he started to read, on, he turned on the tape recorder and he said, is this your your weapon, he started reading off the serial number, and I said, well, it looks like it. And he said, would you open the door, please? And I said, you're not coming in. And so he said, I just want to hand you the gun. And I said, okay. So he said, would you look at the serial numbers and read them off? And I said, yeah, and I read them off. And then he turned around and said to me, well, that is your pistol, and you do find it in good working order. There's no damage to it or anything else. And I said, I don't know that. I haven't fired it. I don't know that it's in good working order. Click, the tape goes off. And he says, what do I got to do to make this go away? He said, I got called in by my boss. And he told me, if you don't take this weapon back tonight, 
I got up here before the judge in court. I'm going to be held in contempt of court. And he said, that doesn't look very good. And I said, I don't know. I said, I really don't know what you're going to do. That's your problem, not mine. I'll go out and buy another pistol. I got plenty of them anyway. And so he looked at me and he said, okay. He said, Nick told me you're a player. And so give me a break. And I said, what kind of break? And he said, well, I'll cut you some slack on the street. And I said, I get slack anywhere I go anyway. I don't need your slack. I mean, you just showed me what your slack was like. And then he turned around and says, what about uh, a few hundred bucks? And I said, how much do you make in a night on your stings, on your vice stings? And he looked at me and he didn't say anything. And he said, how much is it going to cost me? And I said, $500. He reached in his pocket, gave me five $100 bills, and said, thank you very much, and he left. So, all the guys were kind of laughing because instead of me paying the police, they paid me. And that's the end of my bedtime story. I hope you enjoyed it, and have a good evening or whatever time you watch this.